Hi everybody, my name is Mikko Hyppönen and we'll be spending the next 30 minutes in this turbo talk talking about you will be built $90,000 for this call. So, let me uh, just outline real quick about the company I represent. F-Secure has 850 people in 22 countries. We've been around for 22 years researching viruses. The last 10 of those, one of our focus areas has been focusing on, on mobile malware, mobile attacks of various kinds. So we've analyzed viruses on Symbian, on iPhone, on Blackberries, on Android, and so on. So that's, that's one of the things we do. Although most of our revenues come from working with ISPs to protect traditional Windows computers. But I really want to start by asking you a question. How many of you had one of these? Oh my god. Yes. That's pretty much, first of all, it dates us. And second of all, yeah, they were great devices, US Robotics. Funny thing, I, when I tried to find this image, I found it from US Robotics website. US Robotics is still around. They are still around today. They have one, 120 employees, which was a bit of a surprise to me. So it sort of disappeared. But that's a modem. That's how we used to get online. In fact, we all used to have modems. In fact, some of our computers still do. Fact is, my ThinkPad here, which is like three years old, still has a modem slot for a, a telephone line. Of course, it's never connected to a telephone line anymore. There is a modem. And back then, when everybody used to have a modem and it used to be connected to a telephone line, we had a problem, particular problem what used to be known as dialers or more specifically porn dialers. So Windows Trojans that would infect your computer and then start making phone calls with your modem and charge money back to you. Quite a bit of these were obvious to the user. They told the user with the EULA that, you know, we will show you porn images or porn movies, and as we show them to you, we'll at the same time we'll be making phone calls to a 1-900 number. And people, of course, ignored that completely because they never read EULAs, especially if they've just downloaded an application to look at porn. They're just going to ignore that. So this was a problem, and this actually was something that many antiviruses put quite a lot of effort into detecting. But this problem went away. We, are not, we haven't seen new dialers using built-in modems to do this in quite a while, because nobody has modems anymore. We all today go online with our Wi-Fi's, with our DSL modems, which can't be used to issue calls to 1-900 numbers, and so on. So, in a nutshell, my, the point of my talk is here. That's a code snippet um, to make a ping, to send one ping packet. Basically, this code snippet right here, which is some Linux source code somewhere, creates a connection between two devices. That's what it does, right? Very simple. Let me show you another code snippet. This code snippet makes a telephone call. This is actually code from a smartphone system, actually from a Symbian system. It makes a telephone call, which is a connection between two devices, right? You follow me? So basically, these two things make the same thing. They create a connection between two devices. However, there is one crucial difference. When this code of sending ping packet is executed, no money is being moved. When this code is executed, this is actually a money transaction. It actually moves money around. Because when you make a phone call, you pay for the call. Now imagine if traditional virus writers who write Windows viruses today would have such an easy mechanism today to extract money from infected computers. That would be like their wet dream. Of course, they don't have that, so they have to go through these, frankly, very complex mechanisms of extracting money from infected computers, like dropping a spam bot to an infected computer, then sending spam through the infected machine to try to advertise Viagra, then sell via. You know, it's pretty complicated. Or to drop a keylogger on an infected Windows box, then wait for the user to go online to make online purchases, get his credit card number, then use his credit card number to make purchases, get yourself laptops, resell them. Again, very complicated. Yet, this is what they're doing. Though, although this is complicated, they still do this. If they would have a direct mechanism of just extracting money straight off from infected computers, it would be their wet dream. But they don't have that. They used to have it 10 years ago when we had modems. They don't anymore. So, another problem with these premium rate numbers comes from, well, there's quite a bit of difference worldwide when we look at th these premium rate numbers that where you can dial and which actually cost you extra money. 
Here in USA, these are the 1-900 numbers. When you go to other countries, you pretty much have these in every, every single country around the world. In Finland, where I'm based, these are the 0-700 numbers. And they can charge you anything from 10 cents a minute to $9 a minute or something like that. Now, 1-900 numbers have several problems from the point of view of the attackers. First of all, you have to have initial investment to get started. You have to actually you know, pay money to su subscribe to one of these services that outsource 1-900 uh, phone lines, typically around $900, maybe $1,000 to get started, which is a barrier. Second problem is that FTC, who regulates these in USA, makes it mandatory there, that there has to be an audio warning or preamble at the beginning of the call telling you where you're calling and who runs it, who owns it, and how much you're going to pay. Even more importantly, if you run fraud, for example, if you would have a dialer today that would automatically issue calls to a 1-900 number and would do it completely illegally without the user knowing, users would realize, they would see this, they would complain, and this would be shut down before any money is moved to the criminal. This has been designed just to prevent fraud like this. You don't get the money immediately. There's a 30-day delay before the number owner gets the money out of the calls, which is pretty neat in, in preventing fraud like this. One thing which was a bit of a surprise to me when I realized this is that here in USA, you can't call premium rate numbers from a cell phone. You can't. They only work from landlines. Of course, of course landlines are going away. Everywhere else, as far as I know, they do work, like local premium rate numbers, anywhere in Europe, anywhere in Asia, do work from cell phones. Of course they do. I don't actually know why you can't call a 1-900 number here in USA, but you can't. Which means, if somebody wants to write a smartphone Trojan to call premium rate numbers, they can't use a 1-900 number. And the last barrier is that these numbers are not international. From USA, you can't call a 0-700 premium rate number in Finland. It will not work. From Finland, if I try to call 1-900 number, it won't work. I'll actually play you an audio clip. Um, what, it, what happens when I try to use my phone in Finland to dial one of your numbers. The call you are attempting to place is not allowed from this line. Please dial 611 for more service. Basically says that the... Yeah. No, it's okay. But it basically says that you just can't reach this number. Uh, the call is not allowed from your area code. Basically, you can't do this international. All right, so let's think from the bad points point of view. This doesn't work. If they want to have premium red numbers, want to extract money automatically with malware, they have to do it with some other mechanism than 1900 numbers. Enter this forum posting from last March. This was posted on XDA Developers, which is an online forum for smartphone users. This one guy wrote this posting explaining that he was woken up on Sunday morning at 2.40, 2.40 a.m. He woke up because he was sleeping right next to his phone and the lights on his phone turned on. And he looked at his phone and his phone was making a phone call. All right? So he looked at the log and realized that his phone had actually made a number of calls. So he... We was baffled about this. He made this posting. Uh, he listed the numbers that he found from his phone call logs and asked, does anybody have any idea what's going on? Well, nobody had an idea. No replies. Nothing happened for five days. Then, five days later, suddenly new users started registering on this forum and started posting replies to this forum. And basically all the replies were along the lines that, you know what? Same thing happened on my phone. I'm from Denmark. And same thing happened from my phone. I'm from Tokyo. So people from all over the world started posting replies on this one forum posting. Because what happened is that they had the same thing happening on their phone. They saw from their call logs the number where their phone had dialed in. And of course, what they'll do is that they'll, they'll Google for the number. What else do you do? And when you Google for any of these numbers, you get one hit. One hit only, which was this forum posting. So obviously, all the people who were trying to figure out what was going on with their phone ended up replying on the same thread. So then somebody pointed this out to us. And we went to the same forum. We posted there, basically, you know, explaining that we're an antivirus company. We work with mobile antivirus for a long time. We're pretty confident this is an antivirus, or this is a virus, or worm, or Trojan doing this. And we asked people who were affected by this to post a list of applications they have installed on their devices. And all the users who were complaining were running Windows Mobile. Windows Mobile 6 or Windows Mobile 6.5.
And people posted whatever applications they had installed. And they had different email clients, different calendar applications, different games. But one thing they all had, one thing that was common in all these devices all over the world which were doing this, was that they all had this game. 3D anti-terrorist action, which is a 3D shooting game. It's actually a Counter-Strike clone. It's actually, it's actually a very good game. It's very fast, you know, very nice game. And it's made by this Chinese company called Huike. And Huike is a fairly large OEM game manufacturer writing 3D games. And they've done nothing wrong. This is a commercial game written a year and a half ago, being sold by Huike, typically for $5 or so. What happened was that an unknown Russian hacker got this commercial game, cracked it, removed copy protection, then created a copycat website of Huike, registered in a new domain name that sounded similar, copied the content over, and then posed himself that I am the developer of this game, and submitted the cracked version of the game as a free demo to several Windows mobile download sites around the world, sites where people can download games from their phones. And it is a good game, and now it was free. And of course, these download sites believed that it's the real deal. It, it all looked real, right? How, how would they know that this guy who was coming from this website isn't actually the real company? And of course, the only, the, the, the modification of removing copy protection wasn't the only thing modified in the game. The main modification that was done to the game was this. The hacker had added a small code snippet which modified the system to work so that when the game was installed initially, it waited for a delay of random amount of hours, somewhere between 0 and 12 hours, and then it issued a series of phone calls. Phone calls to these eight numbers listed right here. And it waited for, in hex C350, that's 50,000 timer ticks, waited for the call to go on, and then it shut down the call and issued another call. And once it had called all of these numbers, these eight numbers, then it slept for 31 days. After 31 days, it repeated the calls and slept for 31 days. That's what it does. And when you call these numbers, these will create you around $12 in costs. And the logic in doing this only every 31 days is that most of us have a monthly bill. If you don't have a prepaid number, then you typically get a monthly bill. If you get an extra $12 international calls in your bill, well, some of us will know this, some of us won't. I wouldn't know this, for example. I have you know, so, so much international calls anyway that $12 would easily go through. So what are these numbers? Where was the phone actually calling? Well, it was calling the South goddamn pole. Yes, it was calling Antarctica, it was calling Dominican Republic, it was calling different satellite providers, it was calling Somalia in Africa, Sao Tome and Principe, which is a very small island nation right outside of Africa on the west coast. And it's pretty obvious that, you know, if you call far away places like this, it's going to be an expensive call. Everybody understands that. If you're going to call the South Pole, it's going to cost you money, right? So how does the guy get money out of this? That's the crucial part. How does this actually work so that the guy running this operation is able to get money out of it and is able to do it without getting caught and is able to continue it, although there might be attempts to take him down? And this is all done by the fact that these numbers are so-called international premium rate numbers, which means they are not premium rate numbers. They're perfectly normal numbers in perfectly number, uh, normal number space, but they are very expensive and they've built so that they actually fund money back to the person who's operating the number. And this means that these numbers will work from anywhere in the world and they will work from cell phones. So if you compare these numbers to the 1900 numbers here in USA, well, you can call this from USA, you can call this from cell phones and they will generate money to the person operating it. They do all the things that you cannot do with 1900 numbers and they will work from any country in the world. Any phone anywhere in the world will be able to call these numbers and they will fund money back to the operator. And these are call, called illegal call terminations, also known as short stopping or long lining. And the basic idea is actually very simple. Let's, for example, assume that we want to make a phone call from here in Nevada 
to Somalia in, in Eastern Africa. Uh, that would object the uh, minute price from AT&T or Sprint. It was $2.55 a minute when you make a call like that. So it's pretty expensive. But you can understand because Somalia is far away, it's a developing country, all that, you know. Now, the trick is when you call one of these numbers, for example, the number that was listed right here going to Somalia, it actually won't go to Somalia. The call gets disconnected, for example, in Florida or Canada or Australia or the Netherlands. And they keep the rest of the money. And calling Florida from Nevada costs you a couple of cents, which means they get to keep over $2 a minute of extra. And this is what's known as short stopping or long lining, illegal call terminations. They are terminating the call before it actually reaches the place. So when your phone, if it was infected by 3D anti-terrorist Trojan, when your phone was calling the South Pole, it actually didn't call the South Pole. But you paid for the call to South Pole, and someone else, the virus rider, got the money instead. So it's pretty neat. So how do you actually create a number like this? How do you create a number that uses these call terminations or short stopping? Well, you just go online and you search for this, and you'll find several operators that are selling numbers exactly like this. International premium rate numbers in Zaire, in Madagascar, in Cameroon, in, in Niger, and elsewhere. This, this is World Premium Telecom. They're selling numbers in Latvia, Belarus, Sierra Leone, Lithuania, Kosovo, Myanmar, Georgia, and that's Georgia, the country, not the state. Here's another one selling numbers in, yes, Afghanistan, Albania, again, Antarctica. And these are all based on the same idea, that the calls are terminated before they reach the actual destination and the money is funded back. And these provide daily payments or weekly payments. So you don't have to wait for 30 days. And the ch fraud checking that's being done by these guys, well, I don't really know, but I'm guessing it's not nearly as stringent as would be by a real phone operator. And there's no legislation. There's no FTC governance. It's really hard to actually figure out where these guys operate themselves. And, and if you just think about this, here's a list of one of these operators. They're selling, look at this, they're selling numbers in North goddamn Korea, right there. You can buy a North Korean number, plus 358 goes to North Korea, which of course never goes to North Korea, but can be used for exactly this. And now, I'm sure there is some logical, perfectly fine explanation why somebody would like to buy a number like this, and which, which wouldn't which would make sense and which wouldn't be illegal or fishy in any way. I'm sure there is an explanation, but I can't figure it out. I'm, I, do, I can't imagine a non-shady reason why somebody would like to have a phone number in North Korea and get extra money out of whenever somebody calls that number. If you can figure it out, you tell me. And these operators, like I said, these are fairly easy to find. Um, Again, I'm sure there are logical reasons why they keep doing this and why this is not really being regulated. Some of them seem to be very touchy about this subject. I made a short blog post about this when I was researching background for this, for this talk, mentioning a couple of these operators, and I immediately started getting threats from one of these operators. So they seem to, seem to be a bit touchy about the fact that if somebody starts looking into their operations. No, just nasty emails. That's what I got. Nobody was trying to beat me up, no. And there are a lot of problems, like, like if you have an international phone number like this, like for example the, the numbers used by the 3D anti-terrorist Trojan. I wasn't able to figure out who operated those numbers, like which of these companies was running those numbers. There's no way to do that, no way that I'm aware of. You, which means there's nowhere you could actually complain. How do you get such a number shut down if you can't figure out who's the operator behind it? These are pretty nasty problems. Those numbers, those eight numbers used by 3D anti-terrorist Trojan are now shut down. They don't work anymore. I don't know how and who did it, because we sure didn't do it. We tried shutting them down. We couldn't find any party where to report them. And of course, eventually, virus writers will realize that it is easier to make money by infecting phones than it is by infecting computers. Because you have this built-in billing mechanism on phones that you do not have 
in computers. And also, let's remember that there are more phones on this planet than computers. But of course, this hasn't happened yet. And my uh, uh, numbers on what, what, the, what the difference of the amount of malware today on Windows side and what amount of malware today on phone side is nicely illustrated by this figure showing uh, the difference between the size of sun and <laughs> size of earth. So there really is a world of difference right now. You're really not very likely today to get infected by a mobile phone attack. Not even the kind of stuff that the 3D anti-terrorist Trojan was done. Yes, there were global infections, but even then the number were probably in hundreds, more than, or, or not, maybe in thousands, but not more than that. So the problem really isn't there. It could be, but it isn't. They were done from, and those attacks that you mentioned were done from phones using phone malware or something else? Uh, it was kind of brute forcing against uh, Asterisk systems. Sure. Or uh, they did uh, actually hijack customer accounts, voice accounts, mm -hmm. and uh, keep calling uh, via some proxy some time. Yes. So, yes, there is tons of like traditional hacking going on which uses premium rate numbers to get money out of it, including hacking voice over IP systems and asterisk systems and others. What I'm talking about here is the difference between PC malware and mobile malware, specifically using mobile malware to issue calls straight from the smartphone. And that difference is that big. 500 mobile malware, of which only a handful tries to do premium rate text messages or premium rate calls. So this problem doesn't exist yet. We only have a handful of examples. My theory on why the bad guys aren't doing more of this already, is in the operating system market shares. Low-hanging fruit is Windows, and it is Windows XP. Most of the malware today is being written for Windows, specifically written for Windows XP, because Windows XP is nine years old, almost everybody's running it as administrator. It has by far the biggest market share. 62% of the computers on this planet are running Windows XP. 15% uh, Vista, 12% Windows 7. That's the latest figures I could find. Which means, why on earth would the attackers even consider targeting any other platform right now than Windows XP, where they already have existing attacks, existing malware frameworks that work and bring great results. They're getting great money out of current attacks. They don't have to move anywhere. And they won't. Of course, eventually this will change. In two years, Windows XP will no longer be the most common operating system. It will be replaced by Windows 7. And of course, Windows 7, sure, can get infected, but it's harder. You know, there's a bigger barrier again. And it's perfectly possible when the current virus writer gangs realize that they have to start putting in more effort. They have to start porting their software from Windows XP to somewhere else, to Windows 7. Or maybe, maybe some of them look around and realize that actually targeting phones might be a better idea. We'll see. But right now, I'm not really expecting a huge amount of rush from the current virus riders, from their current platforms to mobile, because it works so well for them already right now. Why would they move? Such an easy target. So what should you do to protect against attacks like this, to protect a scenario where your customers or your users are hit by a piece of malware and which uses their smartphones to issue calls to faraway places. Well, the usual, lock down the devices, prevent installations of third-party applications, set up policies, tell your users not to install games, especially not the 3D anti-terrorist game. And of course, you, then you can buy expensive security products on your device. For example, we have a solution for this, which we'd be happy to sell to you. But frankly, right now, most of our customers who buy security products for their smartphones aren't actually buying it to prevent mobile phone viruses. They're more looking into other features that security products provide, like anti-theft, uh, online backup, remote lock, remote wipe, that kind of features. Because that's something you need already today, while antivirus and mobile firewalls is something you would need more in the future. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. I, uh, Recommend all of you to follow me on Twitter. I, uh, 
I have 7,500 followers. I'm 90 followers behind H.D. Moore, and I want to reach him. So please, help me reach H.D. Moore. <laughs> and that's what I had. Please, any questions? Yes? Question was about the smartphone operating systems and which one we see targeted by malware. The example I was giving was the, this 3D anti-terrorist Trojan and another version of the same uh, Trojan, which was a, a poker game. We're targeting Windows Mobile. But if you look at the mobile malware by platform, it looks like this. 516 mobile phone attacks we've seen so far, majority by far targeting Symbian. Symbian, like, for example, my Nokia phone right here. Question, why Symbian? Because Symbian is the king of the hill. Symbian is the gorilla. They, by far, have the biggest market share of smartphone operating systems. They are three times ahead of BlackBerry or iPhone or Android or Windows Mobile. Of course, here in USA, nobody runs Symbian. But you go anywhere else, and it is by far the most common platform. So most of the attackers are writing for the biggest operating system. Yes, there are some attacks for others, but Frankly, very little. So that's, that's the distribution of malware today. We have seen, for example, the FlexiSpy uh, remote spy program is available for BlackBerry. So it's not, it's, it's not a virus or a worm, but it's a spying tool that can be installed on a BlackBerry and then to be used to remotely listen on the phone call, see the location of the phone, turn on the microphone remotely and listen in what's being discussed. That would be a typical example of BlackBerry malware. But uh, outside of that, there's very few examples. Yes? Do you have a larger list of numbers which are used for such kind of fraud? Fraud numbers? <sighs> Not really. What we have seen, in addition of the eight numbers I listed, the 3D poker art <coughs> game, which was done by the same Russian hacker with exactly the same logic two weeks later, it had the same list of numbers, except it only used seven numbers. So it, it, it had even smaller list of numbers. Then we've seen similar attacks with Java Trojans, with sent text messages, but those have only been seen inside Russia. So the Trojans are in Russian language. They use Russian numbers, which only work within Russia. So you don't have to worry about those outside of Russia. Those numbers, sure, I can provide that list to you, but that's only eight numbers. So forging the caller ID using voice over IP to get the user call back, maybe, or something like that? Is that what you mean? Establish the call from that. Right. Well, the problem is, it, 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 yeah. It depends on the how, how the billing is done. If, if you have a system where the receiver pays for the call, possibly. We haven't seen that. But what we have seen is that there are calls being placed from those very expensive numbers and hanged up immediately, leaving you a missed call. And of course, people call back when they have a missed call. That's something we have seen, but that has nothing to do with mobile malware. That's just a traditional attack. Um, not too interesting from our point of view, but that's what we have seen. And we believe those are done with voice over IP systems, yes. Yes? So the question was about blocking these numbers. Of course, you can get your operator to block these numbers. So for example, if your operator is AT&T or T-Mobile, you can call them up, explain that these are bad numbers, and they will block anybody from T-Mobile or from AT&T calling the numbers. That's not going to solve the problem. It, it's, that's one operator in the world. So the real way would, of course, to be to shut down the numbers themselves. That's much harder to do. And one last question before we switch for the next talk. Yes? You want to see them? I'll show you. They're only for jailbroken iPhones. That's the trick. We haven't seen a single virus worm Trojan which would work on a non jailbroken default iPhone. All right? Yes, there's been exploits. No, we haven't seen a single exploit used maliciously in the wild. Not a single one. Not on iPhone, not on any other platform. That's the important point. 
We haven't seen mobile exploits being used by malware ever. That's very important. The things we saw on iPhone was this guy, uh, an Australian guy called Ashley Towns, who wrote the IQ worm in November last year, uh, basically just scanned IP ranges, in these IP ranges which belong to different operators around the world who had iPhones in their, uh, 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 who were selling iPhones, including uh, quite a few operators around the world. Whenever it found an iPhone, it checked if port 22 is open, which is the SSH port, and then it tried logging in as root using the password Alpine. And of course, every single iPhone in the world has the same root password, which is Alpine. So if you had jailbroken your iPhone and installed SSH, but hasn't, haven't changed your root password, you got owned. What did this worm do once it infected your phone? Well, it changed the wallpaper on your iPhone to an image of Rick Astley. <laughs> yes, very funny. What wasn't so funny was that three weeks later, we found a modified version of the same worm. This time, it did no visible changes at all. This time, once you get infected, you wouldn't be able to tell that you're infected. Here's a snippet of the source code of, of that uh, uh, second worm. If you look close here in the bottom, you can actually see it issuing, this is a shell script, so it issues a curl command to connect to this IP address. And this IP address is in Lithuania, belong to a hacked ad agency. And as you can see, it downloads a PHP file. When this was going on, I went to that website. I just used downloaded the same PHP file. And look at this. This audience should actually be able to get this. I'm downloading a PHP file. You can see here that what I'm getting is 404 not found. What's wrong with the image? What's wrong? What's going wrong here? This is, isn't actually the way it's supposed to be. Exactly. Very good. Header says 200 OK. So what I'm getting, I'm getting a HTML file which says 404 not found. But actually, is the file is there. I got a file which just tells me that. Which, to me, immediately tells that, OK, there's something here. This, it's, a, it's the right site, but I'm doing something wrong. So I went back to the source code. I looked at the user agent. Yes, it, it used a special user agent, um, user agent called HTML get 1.0. So when I just repeated the same. Uh, file request with HTML get 1.0 as the user agent, I got a different file. This time I got a shell script. Four lines of shell script, which was executed on the iPhone. Look at that. It modifies the etc hosts file on the infected iPhone, changing the iPhone so that every time you try to access the host name uh, million.ing.nl, it goes to this IP address instead. Instead of going to the Netherlands, where .nl is, it goes to this IP address, which is in Tokyo. And uh, anybody from the Netherlands here? No, how do you say Of course, Ricard. How do you say Migin? Is Migin. Mine. Mine.ing.nl, which is, means me.ing.nl, basically. So it's my online bank with the ING bank, which is one of the largest banks in Europe. So if you were doing online banking from your iPhone in ING and you were infected, let's have, take a look. That's the website of, of ING. You can see the URL right here, https, migin, sorry, migin, ing.nl slash internet bankiere. That's the real site. That's the login for their online bank. Now look carefully. I'm going to change the host name from ing.nl to the IP address. Now we are in Tokyo, and the site looks the same. So it's a full copy of the site. And this change, the fact that, uh, you know, you, when you're doing this from your infected phone, you actually don't see this at all. And the real site was actually hacked, site selling pottery in, 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 in Japan. So they hacked it because they had an SSL certificate, and they needed an SSL certificate for the hack to work. So these are the two iPhone Trojans we see. So it's a banking Trojan trying to steal people's money. And I don't think it was very successful. I think it would actually be much more smarter from the attackers not to try to do complex things like this, but instead just make international calls to premium rate numbers and get money instantly. And that's where I believe the future of mobile malware will be. Thank you very much.